to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ your words were found and i did eat them and they were to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse number 16. We welcome you today of our study of the Word of God together as we think about the use and importance and inspiration of this book, the Word of God. We encourage you, if you're joining us today for the first time especially, to visit the Church of Christ in your local area. These broadcasts are brought to you by members of the Church of Christ and congregations worldwide, and these people have a love for the book, and they'd love for you in your local area to stop by and visit them, attend their assembly, and get to know them a little better. I promise you, you'll find people who have a genuine interest in souls and the Word of God. We also encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com, where you'll find a host of of free Bible study material. We have both DVD and CD format, audio and video format, as well as Bible questions that are answered, uh, correspondence courses, and a host of Bible study material that would greatly benefit you. If you'd like to have a free copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you free of charge. You can email us or visit us online or contact us through the information given at the end of this broadcast. In this series of lessons, we're talking about the inspiration, importance, and, and really getting the most out of our Bible and our Bible study usage. I remember vividly, my wife and I were looking at a home to buy that, and we walked into the home. And as we walked through, it was kind of a mess, I'll just be honest, and as we walked through, we walked into what seemed to be a great room. And in that room was a pool table. And on the corner pocket of that pool table, something caught my attention. Evidently, they had had a party there the night before, and the pool room was littered with long neck beer bottles. But I especially remember something, a beer bottle setting on something. And as I draw closer, I'll never forget the image. In the corner pocket of that pool table was a Bible. And right on top of that Bible was a beer bottle. And I thought to myself, isn't that the most strange use of the Bible that I've ever seen? I've seen the Bible used for a lot of odd things. And some of those things were very strange indeed. Some have used it to prop doors open. Others have used it for purely a decorative purpose. I've seen... Even in worship, children get a spanking with the backside of a Bible. But you know, that was probably the most unusual use of the Bible and most striking use that I've ever seen. And so today we're going to talk about how to get the most out of your Bible. And we begin by mentioning here are some ways not to use the Bible. For example, don't use the Bible as just a purely decorative art piece. Now, don't get me wrong. Bibles are indeed beautiful, and they have a beautiful, beautiful significance to them. In the various bindings that we have today, they are beautiful. But friend, the Bible is not meant to be a decorative art piece. The Bible is meant to be a, a tool that is used, like a tape measure, like a hammer, like a shovel. The Bible has a use. It is meant to be used. It is meant to be worn out with one's study of the Word of God, not just to sit on a bookshelf or a coffee table to look nice. We encourage you as well, don't just use the Bible to gain knowledge alone. Knowledge puffs up, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. And the idea is knowledge alone without use puff one up and so or could puff one up. And so when I come to the Bible, I don't want to just gain knowledge. You know, you could know, listen carefully, you could know every fact from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 2-21 and still never please the Lord if you don't use it properly. 
Paul said in Philippians 4 verse 9, The things which you heard and received and saw in me, listen carefully, these do, there's the application, and the God of peace will be with you. We also mention this, another incorrect use of the Bible would be to prove self-right and someone else wrong. Now, friend, don't get me wrong, the Bible has the answer. We want to look to the Word of God when decisions, when problems, when uh, discussions come up, and we want to let God's Word decide, but I don't ever want to have the mindset, I'm going to go to the Bible and prove them wrong and prove that I'm right. Listen carefully. It's not about me, and it's not about them. It's about what does God say. I don't want to prove somebody wrong. I want to let truth shine forth as right. I, want to, I don't want to prove myself right. I want to find what God says is right and let God receive the honor and glory. You've got to remove the idea of self. Prove, I'm going to prove them wrong and show them. I'm going to prove myself. Well, wait a minute now. It's not about me and it's not about you. Let's let God shine forth. Let's let His Word have the glory and never make it about a personal contest in that sense. And so we think today about the question, how can I get the most out of my study and use of the Bible? Here are the ways. Number one, you can use your Bible correctly, first and foremost, by obeying it. Do you remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, verse number 28? Jesus said this, Blessed are those who hear the word of God, now listen, and obey it. Not enough just to hear. Oh, Jesus wants people to hear. Jesus did want people to hear and does today. In fact, to the seven churches of Asia, Jesus said in every one of those letters, him that has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus would say, take heed how you hear. Take heed who you hear. Take heed what you hear. Those ideas we find in the Bible in Mark chapter 4. But you know, it's not just hearing. That's not, hearing the Word of God alone is not going to save. If you want to get the most out of your Bible and use it correctly, you've got to obey this book. That's really what God wants. What did God want of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? God said you can eat of every tree of the Garden of Eden in the garden. You can do as you please. You can do these things. All this is yours to enjoy. Don't eat. Just don't eat now of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and midst the garden. The day you eat it, you shall die therein. What did God really want of Adam and Eve? To obey Him and to love Him. Isn't that what Jesus said in John 14, 15? If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. You are my friends if you do whatever I ask. John chapter 15, verse number 14. And so when I think about the Bible, I open its pages, I, I hear its messages, I, I see its change that needs to be made in my life, I see corrections in what I may need to do or believe. How am I going to get the most out of this book? Not just here, not just mentally, but in the changes I make in my life. You know, there have been a host of people, and Jesus spoke directly to these types of people and probably some of his harshest language was to those who wanted to you know recognize him but not really follow him let me give you an example in Matthew chapter 7 verse number 21 Jesus said this he asked of those who claim to be followers of his in Matthew 7 21 you know why do you call me Lord Lord and do not do the things which I say. Luke 6, 46, Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 21, not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, is going there, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so what is it we're really trying to get out of the Bible? I'm not just trying to gain knowledge. I'm not just trying to learn the facts and read the Bible and somehow that change. I've got to let it change my life. I've got to obey the Word of God. Remember again Luke 6, 46, Jesus said to the Jewish hypocrites, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? His point is this, don't call me Lord unless you're willing to submit and follow me. And so the words of Christ in Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9 strike such a, a powerful tone in our hearts. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation, how we want Him to be to all those 
who obey Him. Friend, I've got to let the Word of God take full course in my life by obeying it. Now, let's make that practical. What do we mean by obey the Word of God? Here are some practical applications. I've got to change my mind and my thinking to match the thinking of Scripture. Do you remember Philippians 2 verse 5? The Scripture said, Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. If I'm going to let the Bible affect me and really get the most use out of, use out of it, I've got to learn to transform my mind and thinking to the mind of Christ. I've got to transform my actions into Christ actions. John 2 verse 5, Jesus' mother said, Whatever He, Jesus, says to you, do it. Friend, could you find better advice than that in all of Scripture? Whatever Jesus says to you and to me, we've got to do it. John chapter 2 verse 5, uh, practical application. I've got to, as I read my Bible, I've got to strive every day to step where Jesus stepped, to walk where He walked, and to pattern my actions after Him. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21, For to this were you called, because Christ also suffered and died, leaving us an example that we should follow in his footsteps. I love the example of Acts chapter 4 verse 13. Peter and John have been questioned about the healing of the lame man in Acts chapter 3. They respond by saying, you know, it's through the power and the name of Jesus in whom only there is salvation. And they quote from the Old Testament scriptures to show Jesus is the chief cornerstone. And so when these religious leaders realize that, and when they look at these untrained and uneducated fishermen, here's what Acts 4.13 says, and then they realized they had been with Jesus. What a powerful impact Christ made in their life, not just in knowledge alone, but by their actions and their decision to follow Him. And so you can read your Bible all day long. You can read every book in the Bible. You can know every fact, every big name, every big word, have a dictionary meaning for it. But until I let it hit me here, until I let it really change who I am, I'm not getting the most out of my use of the Bible. Secondly, we mention this, and it goes hand in hand with the first. If I'm going to get the most use out of my Bible, I've got to devour it. Let me remind you again of that beautiful passage we began with. Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Jeremiah said this, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. You know, coming from Jeremiah and what he faced, what a powerful lesson that was. Jeremiah had been beaten, he had been slapped, he had been put in prison, he had been thrown in the dungeon. Really, nobody wanted to hear him, and everybody wanted to hear the message of the false prophet, Hananiah. But Jeremiah said, it's your word I'm going to devour. Friend, listen carefully. If I'm going to get the most out of my Bible, I've got to devour it. I've got to have a spiritual appetite for the Word of God. Let me give you a couple of passages again from the life of Jesus that teach us about this. Both of them are found very close to each other. The first is Matthew 4, and here's the context. Jesus has been out in the wilderness 40 days. He's been there with a wild beast. Mark records for us, no doubt, he's hungry, he's lonely, he's thirsty. In fact, the Bible tells us he's hungry, and Satan, seeing that physical temptation, said to Jesus, if you're the Son of God, prove yourself. If you're the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. Christ could have done that. Probably would have tasted good. Probably would have took away some of His hunger. But you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I've got to make sure that I have that longing and desire to, to know God's words, to consume it, and to let it really take full course in my life. Second passage that we mentioned is found in Matthew chapter 5. In the Beatitudes of Christ, 
Jesus talked about things which would give one the blessed, the, the happy, the peaceful, the joyful life. And he said this in Matthew 5 verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Do you have that insatiable desire to really know the Word of God? There is power to be found in knowing it. John 8 verse 32, you remember what Jesus said? You shall know the truth and what? Truth will make you free. Study to show yourself approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. Proverbs 15 verse 26. Uh, be ready always to give an answer. I've got to be ready. I've got to get ready. 1 Peter 3 verse 15. And so when we think about, I'm going to want to get the most out of my Bible. I really want to ma maximize its use in my life. I got to devour this. But you know, part of devouring it is taking what you devour and letting it work in your life. Let's take an illustration from the human body. A man sits down to supper and he eats his supper and he may not like everything on his plate. There may be, in my case, there's about three things I really don't like to eat. I don't like liver, I don't like sweet peas, and I don't like sweet potatoes. I've tried them everywhere in the world and I just can't be happy with none of those. And so let's say uh, I sit down and I eat those and I eat one of those and I may not like it, but I eat it. Does that help me in any way? Well, you bet it does. It provides the nutrients my body needs. It, my cells become enamored with that protein and the, and the vitamins and the minerals that are in there and I can function and live from day to day because of what I take in spiritually or physically. Now, let's make the application. Spiritually speaking, as I devour the Word of God, I've got to let it take full course in my life. I've got to let the Word of God work in my mind, my heart, my actions, my thoughts, the speech that I have. I've got to let it be that which I feed off of spiritually. And friend, I promise you it provides great, great support for one's spiritual life. Remember again 1 Peter 2 verse 2. The Bible says, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. I start off as a Christian maybe on the milk of the Word, but I don't stay there. Hebrews 5 says, by this time, you ought to be on the meat of the Word, and yet some were still stuck on the milk. I've got to put the Word of God in my heart and mind and be able to use that in my everyday life. And then, friend, we mentioned this about using the Bible getting the most out of it. If I'm going to use the Bible and get the most out of it, you know, I've got to really love and cherish this book. Listen to Psalm 119, verse 97. The psalmist said, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Do we really love and cherish the Bible? Now, just as a backdrop and background, here's why we ought to. Why do I love the Bible? Friend, the Bible tells me how I got here. I was created in the image of God. That's special in and of itself. I have a, a soul that is going to live somewhere forever, and there are only two options, heaven or hell. And to make sure, although I had doomed myself by sin, to make sure that I could live with God in heaven. The Bible tells me about what God did through history, and ultimately, we cherish the Bible because of the great sacrifice it tells us about. You shall call His name Jesus. He'll save His people from their sins. He left heaven, came to this earth. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that we, through His poverty, might be made rich. It tells me that God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. It tells me that He went through life doing good. Uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 37, He has done all things well. And it tells me ultimately about the sacrifice He made for me and you. That one called Jesus who would save His people from their sins, John saw Him approaching and He said something different. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It tells me that Jesus suffered. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was spit upon. A crown of thorns was placed into His brow. He hung on a cruel cross of Calvary, struggling for every breath. And it tells me that Jesus said the words, It is finished. And He did that so that I could have the hope of heaven. Friend, the Bible tells me how much God loves me. 
And that makes me want to and causes me to cherish and love the Word of God. Now, let's make some application to that. If I really love the Bible, and I really cherish it, how does that impact my life? It impacts it because I want to give it a priority. It impacts it because I want to let it be the final standard. It impacts my life because I want to draw near to God. I want to know Him more. I want to be more like Christ. I want to, I want to in some small way, show my love back to God. I cherish the Bible because of all God has done for me and all God has done for you in this life. And then, as we have mentioned already, and we say it for emphasis sake, Friend, if you're going to use the Bible and get the most out of it, you've got to live it every day. There is no, there's no way, nothing I can do to put in its place. There's no substitute for living the Bible every day. Listen again to James 1 verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. If I'm going to get the most out of the Bible, I've got to use it. What's that mean? I've got to live by it. Things which you received and heard and learned and saw in me, these do. Philippians 4 verse 9. When Jesus says to me and when he says to you, for example, go into all the world. How do I get the most out of the Bible? By getting up and going with the message of Christ. When Jesus says to me and he says to you, come follow me. And I read that in my Bible. How do I get the most out of that? By getting up and following Christ. When Jesus says something is sin or temptation or against the will of God, how do I get the most and really live that? If I'm doing it, I've got to change. If it's a temptation, I've got to watch out for it. And I've got to be on guard and I've got to make changes in my life where that's necessary. If someone has problem with their speech or someone has problem with maybe an anger issue or, or someone may be having problem in their marriage. When I hear Christ's words on those subjects, if I'm really going to maximize the Bible in my life, I'd have to control my anger better. I'd have to say to myself, it's not what Christ wants you to do. I'd have to say, that's not the way God wants you to act. I'd have to say, when I say words that maybe aren't right to God, I'd have to say to myself, you can't do that anymore. You've got to work on that. You've got to think about it. I'd have to love my family, love my wife more if that was a, if that was a challenge that I was facing. And so really the, to maximize the Bible, friend, you have got to use it every day and make that a big part of your life. And then we mention a hard one. As we talk about maximizing the Bible, and we've mentioned this in the last one just a little bit, but here's what it is. If I'm going to maximize the Bible in my life and its use, I've got to change to it. Friend, this is where it all becomes a, a challenge. This is what we might say where the rubber meets the road. Joel said this in Joel 2 verse 13. The scripture says, Rend your hearts, not your garments. I've got, you know, here's the background of that. You know, that passage may not make a whole lot of sense to us until we think about what the Jews were really good at doing and what they weren't good at doing. Joel is writing to a people who are steeped in idolatry and these people are, they have some historical background in the Bible and they do certain things but they don't follow it through. Here's what they do. When something happens and they're confronted with the Word of God and they recognize sin or change that needs to occur, they were great about casting dirt in the air. They were great about tossing ashes on themselves. They would even go as far as to pluck the hair out of their beard or their head or their eyebrows, which seems crazy to us. They'd do those things and then they'd go right back and start living in the things they were doing and feel somehow justified. And so Joel said this, tear your hearts and stop tearing your clothes. They would tear their clothes. But they never changed their heart. Job said, quit tearing your hearts, quit tearing your clothes, quit plucking the hair out of your beard in essence, quit throwing dust and ashes on your head, make changes in your life first. Reminds me of what Jesus said in Luke, in Luke chapter 3. Certain Jews came out to be baptized by Jesus and Jesus said, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he said this, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. What's the point we're driving home? It's this. If the Bible is ever going to mean anything in your life and it's ever going to be anything in my life, I've got to change my life to match this book. Again, that's challenging. That's hard. 
Nobody likes change. We're all a little bit resistive to that. But friend, here's what we say as far as application goes. If, for example, you study the Bible, you read it, you hear the message about Christ and about salvation, and, and someone hears what to do to become a Christian. Let's say, you know, they hear that you've got to hear the Word. Romans 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Once they've heard that message about Christ, the, the Scripture teaches that we must believe in Jesus. John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus said, Lest you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. And someone says, Well, I've heard the Word, I believe in Jesus, and then they're willing to repent of their sins. Luke 13, 3, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Having repented, we've got to make that good confession. Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, Neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And then on the day of Pentecost, people were told, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of eternal life. And let's say someone says, Well, I've never done that. I, I didn't know that I had to repent. I didn't know that I needed to make the good confession. I didn't know that I had to be baptized for the remission of sins. Friend, if you want to get the most out of your Bible... You've got to change to it. That may mean breaking some ties. That may mean admitting wrong. That may mean that one have to make some serious changes. But may I ask you this? Whatever I have to give up, whatever I have to change, whatever I have to do differently because the Bible tells me to, wouldn't it be worth it in the end? Here's what Jesus promised you. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Jesus said, I go to prayer place for you, and if I go to prayer place for you, I'll come again and receive it to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, and John 14, verses 1 through 6. And so we hope today that as we think about our Bible and as we think about getting the most out of it, that these principles will encourage all of, encourage all of us I'm not just going to study and gain knowledge out of my Bible. I want to really let it change my life. I want, to, I want to transform my life into the image of Christ. I want to walk closer to Him every day. I want to love Him more. And more than anything, I want to let this book have free course in my life so that one day I can go to heaven and live with God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, Three seven one one one.